So here the scope of the services are very limited. It may be just depending on one or more, uh, you know, particular domain object that is going to based on. For example, if we can you know, think about, say, for example, we have like a user service which deal with the user domain, which may include several things like user registration, uh, user password forget, user details. Then there can be another service named user profile, which can have user preferences and other profile information. So instead of you know you know clubbing these two services together, we basically our domain object we identify our domain object and based on the domain object we break them. Okay. So that is uh, what basically and what is the you know benefit of that particular microservices is that your services only having like a small amount of data, right? Right. So. All your, your services can be now, uh, it's not tied to your uh, technical stack, right? It is more focused on the domain boundary or the domain context, which is basically known as bounded context. So that is what is microservice when we build. Uh, so basically, as we are focusing on the limited amount of domain, so obviously that it will may take two or three people to, you know, quickly we can build a service and we can maintain only that particular particular services and also less amount of team, smaller team can manage the service. And apart from microservices, there are also another chain that is what we normally see is the function as a service or serverless computing. So whatever service-based computing is about, you know, exposing a single function as a service, okay? So different cloud provider have like a different uh, kind of a function as a service offering. And you can compose this function together using an API gateway or you can build a chain logic between this function using uh, different things known as state functions or application logic blocks that you can do, right? And serverless uh, computing is not tied that particular function to a specific service, a known uh, particular instance or a server instance, be it it is a container base or not. So it is totally managed by your underneath infrastructure provider. And then uh, it is just your, you know, more, becoming more granular and you only are building a particular service based on a particular function or one single unit of work. Right, so it will also, uh, as this is like services, function services are basically very much, you know, quick time to start up than your normal application. Okay, so whatever, you know, framework that is been created and basically take lots of time to boot up. Okay. And these particular things are having it as their own challenges also. So challenges are normally what you find is that it's the startup time, that particular service and the execution speed that it is to do. And also the amount of memory it takes up. The more bigger my service footprint will be, the harder it to be, you know, scale uh, either but, you know, we can, you know, we not able to going to be scaled that quickly. And also, like, if you have like a one uh, service having like BFAT service, which has everything, right? And if the particular service down, it also takes out several, uh, you know, key features of your application together. So there is less amount of resiliency if you create a kind of a monolith kind of a structure instead of, you know, focusing on the microservices or the serverless offering of that. And obviously, as you are breaking down into smaller block, you can, you know, expose that using any kind of protocol, like either you can expose them as a REST API, GraphQL API, WebSocket API, along that you can also expose them as a GRPC protocol. So that will also means a smaller the service, a smaller the team, and then you quickly can, you know, speed up your development process because you are less uh, dependent on others. 
So that's more or less been the pretext of microservices and the need of function as a service. And what are the you know challenges it's tied to address compared to what we have in a monolithic services? Okay. Any question on this now? No. No, sir. Okay. No, sir. And what is the benefit of this as so that each of the services can have is that you can choose the Java version and also you can choose what is the programming version as well. Okay. So what is the benefit of the Micronaut framework? So Micronaut framework is kind of like a polygon. So it is not a dependent on a single language, but it is JVM based. So it can support different JVM programming language to support with. The same framework can support both your Java, your Ruby, your Kotlin. So there are like options to the developer to, you know, supporting those languages. And also it support both microservice as well as your serverless computing. So it fulfill that. And other, uh, you know, benefit, if you use the Micronaut to be used, is that it has a, like a much more faster startup time. That means, it only it's a like open ended service uh, open ended framework. It don't comes with lots of its bells and whistle, lots of its own library, so it doesn't take lots of time to load the classes, right? It can uh, quickly can start up, and also uh, the dependency injection is is not determined at the runtime. Rather than I am meta programming, it's uh, resolved by the compile time. So that will also help with speed up that particular process. The other benefit is that as it is taking lesser library, it takes lesser footprint. That means it takes later memory that we can normally find. Okay. So that's the some of the benefit other benefit what you find is is the convention over configuration so basically when you need to do the configuration right you don't have to do lots of configuration lots of you know normally what we have to do you also have to do is basically configuration of all the bins right uh, normally with the spring, what you find that we have to use some of the configuration are having like auto configuration, right? And here what happened is here you don't have to do much of the configuration explicitly mention that if you have the correct library, uh, like, a, you know, database programming library, etc. So you can quickly, you know, use that particular library and it automatically create a data source. So it is less on configuration and more on the convention, depending on the dependency that is have. And also, as I mentioned, it is like lesser footprint. So obviously it is speed up and it can take a uh, higher throughput. That means the number of requests you can process per second or a particular unit of time is much more better, faster compared to the other. Okay. And then also there is like a dependency injection, as I mentioned, it is happening on the compile time, which has been resolution and it is not uh, dependent on the runtime. So it's more faster. Those dependencies and errors are in difficulty to find out. Okay. And Another thing is that it has like a sensible defaults, right? Whatever, you know, configuring, configuration that will bear what will be the certain configurations, the defaults of those configuration is being switched on. Okay. So that's are the, some of the benefits that you can find compared to even with the Spring Boot, right? And that's why the Micronaut is much more speed up the development process, deployment process, as well as it's also speed up the our production scaling as well. 
Okay. Now, we are basically we have so far have seen that we have only create synchronous communication. That means if you send a particular request, you have to wait or the client is waiting unless that particular request has been completed, right? So it also support uh, reactive programming or asynchronous programming as well. So both that you can create your REST API asynchronously along with your, your normal convention based uh, you know, programming that you can create, okay? So these are the some of the benefit of using Micronaut that is a compared to the Java application. And the benefit we mostly uh, find that it is very easily we can create a speed of development. We can quickly deploy the startup and execution times are taken less, smaller footprint, and the compile time dependency injection. And it is built uh, some of the built in microservice architecture pattern like cloud native architecture pattern and also circuit breaker. Right, cloud native is by default is supported as well as the circuit breaker pattern is also there. Okay. Now, if I need to create a particular Micronaut service that I can also create. So let me just showcase one of the example applications that we are working on. So let me just explain how that particular different annotation it uses and how it is you know different compared to the other application that we normally find with spring and spring Boot. so let's see first example of this that how we can you know configure the bean so we know that there are like some of the bean scopes are there right so let's see how a service looks like it's just uh, we have this having like one one of the projects that we are currently working on so i'm just doing from that only okay so this is like a our existing application that we are working currently so it's having like a kotlin support as well as the java based build support so it's using gradle so in case of gradle it's just a build tool similar to what we have in maven so here, first of all, this is like a multi-project application, okay? So in the multi-project application, what we have is, is that we are choosing what is the Kotlin version we are using, that is 1.6.20, okay? And then uh, we are choosing that particular for projects, what should be there. So first of all, we are taking few of the plugins that are there. So we are uh, taking the Kotlin plugins that is there for JetBrains and also we are using SonarQube and JCoCo for port coverage and those plugins are also being applied to your sub projects right okay then here where the dependencies are mentioned so dependencies is so Gradle is basically a task based programming thing so where you basically choose what kind of you know tasks that you write so it by default whatever plugin you bring in it enables those tasks for it so let's see one simple service here also we have its own service gradle so in this service gradle what we have is we have the plugins so it's like a micronaut application so that particular micronaut version has been mentioned okay and it also pull in the java dependency okay it also pull in for open api support so it will create a swagger file that is there based on the schema okay that been there and then the version and the group name is mentioned so basically it's going to pull it from the repository one is for the maven center one is from the maven plugin that is called the in kind of plugin dependency it's going to pull in next comes in the micronaut so it choosing its runtime so it's choosing the runtime as native so native being another web container just like you have tomcat it has native as a container then you have the test runtime that is jmnet 5 the latest version that we are using okay 
and then the processing, what is the annotations, what is going to be that mentioned. And then it's mentioning where is the source location is. So project build directory, adding some of the generated source code, they are including that. Next is including uh, Micronaut uh, HTTP validation, open API, HTTP client, Micronaut management, all the Micronaut related dependency. And also it's including uh, your network, uh, your metrics being collected into Prometheus, okay? That is a time series uh, database and Microsoft library is also there as a kind of implementing dependency, validation, Portland runtime. And obviously it has like a JWT security check. So it included JWT security and also it's included Swagger annotations. Okay, and Java it's annotation and logback classic it using for the runtime as a logging configuration. Okay. Other thing it's also runtime, it's uh, dependent on the Jackson module that is for your JSON to Java, Java to JSON kind of a library conversion. Next, you have uh, inject annotation processor, Micronaut port for testing support. And then it has the swagger notation for this implementation, Jackson data binding, find bug, JSON, JSON fire, then other dependency like OPHTP3, login interceptor, etc. has been added. And also, it has mentioned as it's like a Java application, what is the main class? So here also it has mentioned what is the main class and the source completed Java version, which version we're going to be using that is mentioned. And based on the dependencies, other things are being added. Custom tasks they have added. So those are there. Now, just like you know, in our spring, right? Uh, we have sorry.
Uh, sorry, Zda, you are on mute. Let me unmute. So let's look into the same application that we have. Some of us have already seen. Just, just, just going into the different steps. So basically, it's building a micronaut uh, instance first of all. Okay. And as a part of this, what is they are doing? They are just like a Spring Boot. They have like a main function. It's also the same like a main function. It has a build dot functionality is there. Then the whatever argument it is passing. Then it's taking the root uh, package or arguments, then they are starting the application. Okay. That's your basic structure looks like. And it is also been mentioned as a JVM static. So it's indicate that this is like a static method as such. Right. So from here, it will start executing our application. So now, as you have already know that. Uh, it accept the application then yml files just like in the spring you have like a yml dash the environment name that is mentioned out here so whatever multiple environment like a stage port etc you can mention there here you have the here the root of your application configuration is start with a micronaut only difference is just a yml file we can also use with spring yml file as well here is mentioned what is the application name what is the service and service port whether the ports are being enabled by root what is the routes so that they have added the static route for the swagger by default so swagger file whatever is generated that is provided and also it's exposing out metrics by default request metrics and JVM metrics to Prometheus. So it's enable the metrics and then is expose the metrics out to Prometheus server. Okay. Then they are binding it, uh, which kind of, you know, service event loop, just like in Node.js, it's also support event loop, asynchronous Nati built-in server block they are using. They think that particular binding event loop is enabled and it's going to be using the queue by default. And for the event loop, what is the number of threads it will take? So within the event loop, the number of threads will come and it will process the request out of the main thread event loop that is there. Security by default has been disabled. Next, it has HTTP client. Okay. And what is the client read timeout? and read idle time those are mentioned similarly it mentioned whether services looks and for the services specific they have created a even loop group as well okay and then they mention what are the endpoints all endpoints will be running on the port 8080 here the health endpoint is enabled which is sensitive is small anybody can be able to view that prometheus endpoint is also enabled is sensitive also calls and then comes your different custom configuration so custom configuration you can put out here and you can override them using your environment variable that has been provided out here so this way we can you know take the values and override that similarly other custom environment details are being provided also so normally uh, how to create a service on the controller that you can see so controller level if we wanted to use we have the main controller annotations so these are all coming from HTTP annotation so that has all the standard annotation that we are well aware so here, instead of saying that it's a risk controller, what specific kind of controller, it is mentioned only as a controller. Then you have the request, if you are wanted to get from the body, you can get it from the body, HTTP request. Similarly, you have like a delete, put, post, get, patch, option. Those annotation indicating where this particular request has been mapped to. Similarly, you can get your parameter query parameter either from the query value annotation 
or path value annotation. Here also you can you know create HTTP response object and send a class. So here we can see that all the dependency there is no specific dependency specific as such annotations we have to use right it by convention can take the dependency from your property from your bean properties or it may be taking your dependencies from your expo dependencies over your constructor argument so that's why it is called is more convention based rather than configuration based Now here, if you can look into, so here it is basically a get call, and here in the get call you have like a course version, course ID, and the full version, right? These are two path variable. So you can extract your path variable out here, and then you have like a HTTP response object that you can send like OK, accepted, bad request, etc. You can send, and then you are calling your service method, and your know, service method is same. To depend making this this is a bean you have the option to use the one of the different scopes that you can choose so you can choose the jakarta injection so jakarta injections are nothing but your normal injection scopes that are available from java EU. and they are basically say either you can use inject you can use a factory function or a class which can provide a particular result or provide a particular implementation of any interface or a particular beam. Similarly, you can choose a particular scope or you can choose singleton annotation or you can mention the bean name using name annotation. So that been coming from here and again, whatever the sub dependencies are coming into the constructor out. So that is, you don't have to use any specific stereotype out there, any kind of beam, you can, depending on your type, request scope or other scope, you can appropriate beam scope annotation, you can put out here. Okay. Now, normally what we also had previously is the We have also have like an exception handler, right? So that we are in Spring, we are calling basically as a advisor, right? So here, one of the thing that we are using is basically exception resolution. So it just put the exception handler. So it extended from the class like error response processor any and in the error response processor any is basically going to be exception handling illegal argument exception with a, any type of HTTP response we wanted to send across. Okay, so the we have mapped that illegal argument exception to and the request is the HTTP request that the handler method we have overridden. And here, what we have done is we basically, you know, processing the particular response using the processor, the error response processor. And then we are saying that error context that we are using an error context builder. And that is basically having your request object, your cause of exception, your error message that we have built. The error context having the, all the detail about the request object, error message, and the exact exception that has been told. And the HTTP request response has been built out of here. HTTP response, bad response. They are not uh, returning any specific uh, messages. With message, they are saying exception message. So that way we can write our own exception handling method. And here they have used the producers 
annotation so it produces a particular HTTP response out of it. So here we are not going to be similar to the screen. We are just processing the exception handling in a separate exception handler. Then uh, its model is the same. The other thing that we have already seen is the if I wanted to access any kind of other things are being provided is also the event listener or startup or shutdown event. Okay. So there are two events uh, that have been out of the box supported. One is the startup event that happened when your application context gets started. So you get a startup event object. And you can annotate that with the event listener. Similarly, you have like a on shutdown event you can write and you can have like a shutdown event also can be mentioned out here. These are all coming from the different event package and if we go into the event package and there are like also like application event so application events is nothing but if you wanted to create your own event and wanted to communicate asynchronously you can also create that you have to extend the application object and you can either pass the object across the source object out of here and then you can you know listen to the using even listener so apart from that if you wanted to create you can extend that so requires is basically again your micronaut context annotation those are mentioning that this particular object will be required as the time of the your application gets started because this is not getting injected anywhere else So there are like different annotations are there. Like you can have like a different annotation that are for context related are available. For example, you can create a bean configurations. So you can create, you can import another configuration into there. You can create a factory method. You have like primary bean, you can indicate if you have like a multiple interfaces and also you have a like a different scope. One is a prototype. Another, we have seen the required one. Okay. And those are the basic types are provided. Also, we have seen the value annotation. So, value annotations we have used. So, in the value annotation, what happens is if you wanted to just like your string, right? If you wanted to look up any kind of a value that's there, you can hook that up using your value at the rate annotation syntax but here the at the rate annotation syntaxes are a little bit different so we put this search where we have views of value annotation so here we have views value okay So in this class is the request execution holder. Here we are looking up the two URL from the application.yml file. So that is you mentioned the content toolkit dot something else, right? So that you can look it up into your code base also that we have seen. Here, only thing we need to put is we have to escape this dollar symbol. Rest of the syntax is remain the same. The main part, then your sub part that is there that you can you know look up and that you can utilize in your code. So any kind of 
parameter value you can also put it. And also here HTTP client is by default is available. And here in the HTTP client, what they have done is they have mentioned the client CTK, right? So if I just you know again go back to my application configuration, where is the CTK client has been mentioned? Here we have the HTTP client. Okay. So under here the HTTP client. This particular event loop group has been mentioned, and that particular event loop group will be used by the client. So, if you wanted to create an HTTP client, which is by default be available from the micronaut, and then that particular client you can use using that which client you want to use, that is under that particular thing. We can have that now. Also, out here, what they are doing is. So here in this class, they are also showing the other two things that is matrix registry and matrix holder. So let's see those. So matrix registry is nothing but a class they have created, they have you know taken, and this class is coming from Micronaut 4. Okay. And then the matrix holder is a another class. That is also coming out from here the matrix. So, what is the matrix filter is actually doing? So, this matrix filter or matrix is basically is correcting the execution type. Okay. So, this is nothing but an it filter, right? So, it filter which is nothing but your HTTP subnet filter, and this particular subnet filter they have extended from. Okay, so it's obviously have a, like a do filter, right? And they, they have used the filter annotation. So any kind of request will come to this, okay? And from the matrix filter, they are injecting the matrix holder. So what is the matrix holder is currently holding? It's a mutable map of this, okay? You can put any kind of matrix out here in the map with the key name and you can get the value of that particular matrix and you can overwrite that particular value right so let's see who is using this particular matrix only matrix holder is using that okay so what this particular uh, matrix holder is doing it is basically a normal like a filter chain that we are normally exposed to it has taken the request sp request and the filter chain so filter chain we had previously met like a do filter here we have the do request goes it with the request object. So it goes to the particular next in the line of the request processing. So out of here, what they are actually passing, uh, what they are actually you know taking out, they are taking out the particular request path, and in the request URI, they are storing that particular matrix in the in memory map. Now then. When the request is coming up, we are passing this particular matrix registry and matrix holder into this request execution micronaut class. So this class is doing what? This class is actually having like a HTTP client. So default HTTP client will come out here, and it has like an endpoint to which its own service is making a call to, right? Now here we basically, you know, extended form. It basically just having like a constructor. In between this constructor, they are sending all of that. So it's basically having like a request execution. So request execution is nothing but another class they have, you know, generated from the Java, right? Fine, no problem. So so here what happening is that whatever you know parameter graphql request data response object it's taking everything and then it making the call and here let's see what is that particular matrix holder is being used 
and the matrix holder is basically it has like mutable tags it has created mutable list so it says uh, it's adding a tag so where is this tag is coming from this tag is basically a key value dimension from the instrumentation okay and it's saying that for this particular uri this request has been came okay and then when they receive the particular data response they are saying that what is the particular ctk method we are calling so in this particular list of tags they are adding those particular details okay this external service i have called and within that particular external service i have you know making a call to a ctk service and then this is the url i'm making the call to and then for what are the parameters all the mutations i'm basically calling so those details are they are basically putting out here in the tags they are collecting and then then they are using this matrix registry so what is the matrix registry is about and then they are writing the histogram detail of the ctk registry here here they are basically recording that what is the you know time that this particular is to be called as taken so that json response they are getting but they are also recording that using that particular tag and then that particular details are going to their prometheus server where it is going to okay so those are the some of the few blocks or uh, or the some of the annotation that we can help us to create this services let us look into the unit test case that they have written so if i need to write unit test case what i have to do so for example here we provide get the particular test annotation one is known as micronaut test just like spring we have micronaut test a normal jakarta mean we are having the embedded server so with which we can test out the our web layer or the api layer if we wanted to and then from then they have like a like configuration will be created okay and this configuration is the part default java configuration so what they did is in this particular project whatever you know code they are you know generated that particular build that particular code and if you go into the configuration this thing has been you know created out here main test java the whole api is been converted into a java classes and those java classes is basically out here we are using the instead of using any kind of http client that particular java class we use and then whatever you know server embedded server is created that host and port the base url has been set up out here and with the default client we created a swagger client and from the swagger client you have the total api method this is the method of that particular controller that particular controller you can you know make a call to. okay now how this client has been created right so for that we need to go into our build.gradle file so in the build.gradle what happening is by default here we have included this generator so what is this generator does it generate the sources from a swagger file So that means when this particular plugin is bought into, it's automatically when the application starts or application get compiled, it creates a Swagger file with a .yml file that been created, and from that particular file is basically your Java classes are created. The same Java classes are being used out here okay now if your service is dependent on other service can i use mocking out here yes i can use mocking out here so for example here is a very basic example so as you have seen that okay my 
embedded server is run so when i'm going to make a call it's going to go and make a call to that particular endpoint right correct so here we are not done the mocking but let's see yes here we have done the mocking so anyhow they are dependent on the http client right so here you can use the mock beam to create an http client class and you can use your normal mockito statements to create a mock beam out of that particular class and then on the you can mock that particular blocking http client that is internally it is calling and then you basically check when that particular mock or two blocking method call when happening then you return the particular this blocking client that is there and then when the blocking client they are retrieving any kind of a response against a HTTP request and against a HTTP class they are going to be returning the JSON screen converting that into a JSON object and return that. So that's how the particular mocking specific mocks has been used using mock -B. And when you are actually making running this application and making a call with that particular test case, actual external APIs is not been called. By the mocking beam, it has been mocked out. Okay. Now you guys can uh, ask that where this particular uh, mocking beam call is coming from. So mocking beam call is coming from. I think we have seen out here. HTTP client to blocking dot retrieve. So this is the call. This is the call they are actually mocked. So similar way we can mock any other classes if we wanted to. We can create and replace the mock bin and we can use micronaut test annotation that we have on top and then based on the inject we can Exit this. Any questions over? So the last thing we can see is the how we can you know do the containerization of this right so we have like a docker file so as it is running on uh, java right so obviously we're going to be start with the open jdk version you can choose the version 15 they have used and then they have created the work directory a folder they copy all the content that is out here in this folder into this location and then they use a gradle service dot assembly no daemon stack trace. so that means this portion is going to be creating a executable assembly or a jar okay now here we can see that this has been this particular phase this is like a multi-phase or multiple uh, state docker file so one module we have been used to build it okay another different jdk option we have used to run it okay so you can run on the latest jdk if you want to so here you have just add the call command with apk then you have the home.app working directory and from the other copy image section you just copying from the builder from the builder you are copying this build dot layer dot leaves. You are copying out here. It's also as you are copying, and with that particular layer, you have like application dot jar being created, and same application dot jar you have copied over here. And then you have expose your debugger point as well as your application execution point. Then you have created an AT point. It's a simple Java jar. So Java jar, then application dot jar. So, any other questions?
So in this session, what we actually not cover is that Pyconaut having his own CLI. How can you use the CLI to create application controller services, bin, etc. Okay, and also we have not covered how to interact with the data with this. Uh, third thing, uh, some of the architecture design pattern we haven't covered. So we will be cover that in a session to those details. Okay. Any questions so far? If not, that we can in our session. Thank you, guys. Bye.